Well, I invite you to please turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, verses, and we'll be looking at verses 18 to 20. It's on page 967 of the Pew Bibles, 967. Well, we're now only three sermons away from finishing our series on the marks of a healthy church next week. Um, We'll be looking at the topic of worship in the church, and the following week after that, Greg is going to bring everything, <laughs> bring everything together and wrap it in a nice bow. Well, today the topic we'll be considering is discipleship. Now, once again, we're dealing with terms that have probably gone out of vogue and doesn't mean much to us today. So let's just define what we're talking about here. What is a disciple? And I think Trevor did a a really good job in defining that. It simply means someone who follows Jesus. Um, A disciple is a follower. Now you can use the example of of a student and a teacher, but I think it's a little bit more than that. Um, A a student is someone who just accepts what the teacher says, and even these days, students can reject (laughs) what their teachers say. But a disciple is someone who embraces not only their teacher's teaching, but a disciple is one who embraces their teacher's worldview, the way that they see the world. They embrace that teacher's philosophy, how they think about things but they also embrace their pattern of living. So they want to live the way that their teacher lives. In essence, a disciple is someone who embodies their teacher. They become a mini-me of their teacher. Now you may say, well, we don't have that anymore. (laughs) We don't have disciples anymore these days. That doesn't exist. It's something of a bygone era. But I want to suggest to you that, yeah, I think we still do have disciples these days. Like, for example, if I, if I ask you, how do you think about family? How do you think about children, raising children? And then you give me an answer, and then I can tell you who your teacher is. Or if I ask you, what's your philosophy on the church? And I'll tell you who your teacher is. Or if I ask you, what's your philosophy on work? and money, and I'll show you who your teacher is, and I'll show you who you're a disciple of. So the question is not whether are you a disciple, if disciples exist today, the real question is to whom are you a disciple of? Whose philosophy, whose worldview, and whose pattern of living have you embraced? Now secondly, there is another aspect to discipleship. Specifically, when we're talking about being a disciple of Jesus, and that is the cost involved to being a disciple. You know, in the first century, if you wanted to be a disciple, not all, but some disciples required you to pay to be their disciple. Jesus was one of those. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says this to the crowds that were following him. If anyone comes to me, this is Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, what does Jesus say? Such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. And in another account, Jesus speaking to a rich young ruler tells this person that in order to be his disciple, what does Jesus ask of him? To sell all you have and give it to the poor. Now Jesus is dealing with some hyperboles or exaggerations, but what he's trying to get across is this, to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple of Christ will cost you. It will cost you everything. That is why there's no such thing as nominal Christianity. There are two opposite terms. You can't be a Christian merely by birth, or a Christian by name, or a Christian by affiliation. 
To be a Christian is to be a disciple, and to be a disciple is to give up everything you have and to submit yourself under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Jesus uses the term narrow to describe the way that leads to life. And he uses the term broad to describe the way that leads to destruction. Now, which is why I mentioned, I can't remember which sermon it is, that perhaps an alternative title to our series can be The Marks of a Biblically Faithful Church. Because sometimes when we, when we think about health, what we immediately um, associate it with is size. Right? You, you come to a church and you see a large church, the temptation is to call that church healthy. But a large church doesn't necessarily mean a healthy church. Now, don't get me wrong, a large church can be a healthy church, but it's not the only marker of health. Now, I don't know of any pastor who wouldn't want their church to be full. Uh, I want this church to be full. Uh, uh, I wish that every gap would be filled so that we'd save on heating. <laughs> but there's, there's something more to the size of a church that I'm praying for. Something more than just being able to boast that we need to run two services because our church is so full. What I'm praying for and what we all need to be praying for is that every single person who sits here on a Sunday is a dedicated and a committed follower of Christ. A disciple who embodies Christ's teaching, Christ's philosophy, and Christ's worldview, and someone who has counted the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And it is because it is through these disciples, this kind of disciple that God used to turn the world upside down. It is this kind of disciple that God gave the Great Commission to. And so when we come to Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, when we read it, it should immediately cause us to think, cause us to be staggered by the sheer responsibility that is laid before us as disciples of Jesus Christ. What does it say? Let me read for you. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let me pray and then we'll look at our text. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would please remind us and you of these truths that we perhaps already know and perhaps have already heard many times. May it serve as a reminder to us of the calling of our calling as a church and the task that you have given us as your church. In Jesus' name, amen. Now this text is commonly known as the Great Commission and it's called the Great Commission because it's perhaps the primary purpose of the church because it is through the fulfillment of the Great Commission that the church can most glorify God. It is through the Great Commission that God gathers worshipers to him. It is through the Great Commission that we see that great vision of John where before the throne room and around the throne of God, we see people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping God. And so when we think about the Great Commission, what is the Great Commission? And growing up, I've, I've heard 
different sermons and different explanations of what this is. And sometimes when people preach this, they usually don't get past the word go. Right? And they think that great com- the Great Commission revolves around people going. And a consequence of this is that some people have understood this passage to simply mean foreign missions, or it's limited to people going out to different countries, or to people doing vocational mission work. And as a result, people who are in church either ignore it because it doesn't seem relevant to them, or it discourages people because the reality is not everyone can go, and not everyone can go to to the overseas missions field. Or perhaps it pressures people into going into missions when God hasn't called or gifted them for that particular task. Or even more sadly, it causes Christians to think that they are less spiritual and less obedient than those who are going. Or perhaps another view of the Great Commission, apart from going, is that evangelism is the Great Commission. To go and simply tell people about Jesus, and that's it, that is the Great Commission. But is that the Great Commission? Well, in the NIV, it actually makes it a little bit clearer for us. But when you look into the structure of this sentence in the original language, there is one verb, and there is one imperative, one command. And the command is not to go, but rather it is to make disciples of all nations. That is the Great Commission. The commission of the church, the task that has been laid before the church, is to make disciples. How do we do this? How do we make disciples? So I want to orient us around these three words, go, baptize, and teach. Go, baptize, and teach. So there is going. It begins by going. And the word go in our English translation, it reads like a command. And it, it makes sense why people would think that it is, a, it is the Great Commission, because it reads like a command. But if in the original language, this word go is actually in the past tense. It's something that has already happened. So another way to read this is having gone, therefore make disciples of all nations. Jesus assumes that his disciples are already going. So as you go, as you are actively going out, you should be making disciples. So a question we to ask then is, where should we be going? Well, if you remember in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus tells his disciples, you will be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Basically, you should be going everywhere. You should be witnesses in Jerusalem, that is, in your immediate city. You should be going to Judea and Samaria, and these are um, your extended city. You can think about Sydney being our Jerusalem, and in greater Sydney as being Judea and Samaria. We should go to those who are marginalized and to the ends of the earth. So what this means is the Great Commission is applicable to every single Christian. Whether you're a committed Christian here in your local church, or whether you've been called to overseas missions, the Great Commission is for you. We all have a part, whether you're young, you're old, whether you're married or single, working or retired, you have a part in fulfilling God's Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. And this word of all nations isn't restricted to just going out to different countries. It means every single ethnicity. And here in Engadine, you may not notice it, but the nations are coming to us. I mean, I've come to you. (laughs) And I brought Renee with me as well. 
And so there's opportunities even within Engadine to be fulfilling the Great Commission. So as you go out, as you're running your errands, as you go to Coles or Woolies, as you drop off the kids to preschool, to school, as you go to soccer or footy or whatever sports people play in the Shire, you should be going out with the intention to make disciples of Jesus Christ. You don't have to wait for a particular outreach event at church. This should be ingrained in our mindset of, of our Christian life. We should be, to use a, a very popular Christian phrase, on mission every single day, making disciples of Christ. Disciple making, that is calling people to follow Christ, is our primary mission, according to Jesus. But there is one difficulty that I think people face when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission. And that is, a lot of the times, many people have compartmentalized their religious duties and their, and their secular duties. That is, on a Sunday and specific days where there are ministries, that is, for my, that is dedicated to my religious pursuits but every other day is for my secular pursuits. But those categories, according to the Bible and according to God, do not exist. I'll point you to Romans 12, verse one. Paul says here, therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Our whole entire life should be used for the worship of Christ. Our whole life, we've been saved for the glory of God. That's why the Westminster Catechism helpfully teaches us and reminds us in its opening chapter that the chief end of man is to glorify God. God desires our whole life to be dedicated to him and to his purposes for his glory. Now this may seem extreme. I, I, I've been in the secular workplace before and every time you try and blend these two worlds together, even Christians will, will come at you and say, whoa, just relax, man. <laughs> take, this, take this offline. Let's, let's do this after hours. But I want to submit to you that the, the Bible sees no distinction the world, even Christians, may see you as some kind of zealot going above and beyond your call of duty. But is, it, is that really zealotry? Look with me again in Romans 12.1 at the end. This is your true and proper worship. To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. In the authorized version, it renders it as your reasonable service. So to offer your life, to dedicate your entire life for the glory of God is appropriate. It is proper. It is reasonable. It is not above and beyond. It is reasonable for you to invite your friend to church. It is reasonable and appropriate for you to Invite your husband, wives, parents, children, cousins, nieces, nephews, and whatever categories you might have, it is appropriate for us and for you to share the gospel with them, call them to faith in Christ, and even invite them to church. And by God's grace, if they become Christians, that is when they become followers of Christ but it begins by going. The question is, are we going? Are we going out with the purpose and with the intent to call people to faith in Christ? So this is just the beginning. Remember, evangelism is not the Great Commission. Making disciples is. So evangelism is involved, but it's not the end. And as we read in verses 19 and 20, there are two things that a true disciple of Christ must do. That is to be baptized and be taught. 
Let's look at verse 19, and this is under the heading of to baptize. Verse 19 says, Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You know, it is universally known and historically consistent that baptism is the primary means of initiation into the Christian faith. You know, baptism is a visual representation of people being included into Christ's covenant community, that is the church. It is a picture of fellowship, of union, and inclusion. And we actually see that here in this verse. You know, when you read this verse, it says, baptizing them in the name of the Father. And in our modern understanding of this phrase, it, it kind of sounds like a phrase um, of authority, right? In the name of the Father and of the Son, I baptize you. Right? That, that's sometimes how it's understood. But to be more precise, this word in indicates entrance into something. For example, Roy drove his car in the garage. So another way to, to read this is baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And so when a, a new Christian, a new disciple of Christ is baptized, they are being baptized into fellowship with the triune God, with the covenant community, and into the Lordship of God. So what this is trying to picture and paint for us is that when you get baptized, you are, being, you are identifying yourself with Christ and publicly pledging your submission to his lordship. You know, in the first century, especially during the time of the, the, pers the great persecution, being baptized was not inconsequential. When you were being baptized, when you chose to be baptized, you were doing something, something politically subversive. Because when a Christian chose to be baptized, they were saying, I am submitting to Christ's kingdom. His community is my community. His kingdom is my kingdom, not Caesar's. And what that meant is, you are publicly opposing the king, the earthly king. And as a result, is you could lose your your, your livelihood, your job, family, and other earthly comforts, it could have cost them everything. You know, these disciples that we read of in the book of Acts, they knew full well that it could mean these things. But yet, because they knew what it meant to be a disciple of Christ, Baptism wasn't an issue. Baptism doesn't add anything to your salvation. It's not salvific, to use a, a theological term. But it does symbolize something, and it is important. And probably now more than ever in our post-Christian age, to do something that is so obscure, as in getting into a, a, a tank and being dipped, <laughs> being immersed in, into water and saying, I am a Christian, that could be possibly, you know, something that could be politically subversive eventually. It definitely is something culturally awkward and foreign. You know, a New Testament scholar by the name of D.A. Carson writes this about discipleship and baptism. The New Testament can scarcely conceive of a disciple who is not baptized. So in other words, if you become a disciple of Christ, it is assumed that you were going to be baptized. And that gives us some applications today. If you are a Christian and you haven't been baptized, you must be baptized because Christ commands it. Another thing is, is have we as a church and we think about the health of a church, have we emphasized the importance of baptism, of this external representation of this inward reality? 
And so the Great Commission, making disciples, begins by the church going out, calling people to follow Christ. Then those who have been converted are to be baptized shortly after, and this happens only once. But what continues throughout the life of a disciple and should continue in our lives, whether you've been a Christian for one month or 10 years or 50 years, this ought to continue, and that is found in the next verse. Verse 20. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So discipleship should be marked by regular teaching of Jesus' commands. And certainly this also includes Old Testament and the entire scriptures, but they all point to Christ. So Christ should be the emphasis of our teaching. And, and notice how we're not merely to teach what Christ has commanded as if they were just some moral code. They're not merely suggestions on how to live based on Jesus' teaching because you can get a lot from Jesus' teaching. I mean, you have the golden rule. People want to live by that, and, and they will definitely live a, a, a better life if they do do that. They're not merely suggestions, and they're not whether, and it's not up to you whether you want to apply it in your lives. These are commands, and Christ's commands require obedience. Isn't that what he said? Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And so the end of our teaching is obedience to all of Christ's commands. This is why we're committed to the best of our ability teaching the entire Bible. It's a lofty task. It's, it's difficult, but it's necessary. I think it was Ryle, J.C. Ryle, who said that a whole Bible makes a whole Christian. I think that's true. And this at times might be uncomfortable because Christ's teachings will be countercultural. Christ's teachings will go against the flow of culture, and yet a true disciple of Jesus is one who desires to be taught in order that they may be more like Christ. You know, the essence of discipleship is becoming like the master, and this is brought about by systematic teaching of and submission to the word. Now, I originally had two separate sermons for this, but I've I've tried to join them together. And this part here is just application of what this looks like. like. Are we a church that is dedicated to the discipleship of the believers here in this church through teaching? Here are some applications. Teaching comes primarily, though not limited to, from the preaching on the Lord's day. Right, this is why we have pastors. You know, Ephesians 4 tells us that God gave the church certain offices, one of them being pastors and teachers, to equip the church and to build the church till they reach maturity and unity. And that's why it's important that we take what we do on a Sunday seriously. It is why we pastors have a, uh, an important task laid on us and that's why it's important that we gather here to be fed. I don't think it's legalistic to say that it is a necessity to, of course, within reason, to be present at church whenever the word of God is being taught. You know, the Puritans of old called the Lord's Day the marketplace for the soul. And they saw the Lord's Day as the Lord's Day. The entire day, not just the morning, they would hear the sermon in the morning and then during the lunchtime to the evening, they would discuss that with their children over lunch. And then they'd go back and hear another serving <laughs> at nighttime. And they saw the teaching from the pulpit as important. Is this how we view the teachings on a Sunday. Now, another application of this is that teaching, or let's use the word discipleship, can occur 
within the congregation as well. This is the reason why we have growth groups, why we have prayer groups and one-to-one -one Bible studies. That's the reason why we have play group, we have launch, we have youth. It's because we want to be obedient to the Great Commission. But I think there's another application here when it comes to discipleship and this aspect of teaching, and that is its application to individual families. Parents have a responsibility to disciple their children, to teach their children. It's not up to the pastor primarily or to your youth leaders or growth group leaders. It is a parent's responsibility to teach their children. And grandparents obviously have a huge supporting part to play in this important, important goal. So teaching occurs from the pulpit, within the pews. Number three, discipleship occurs primarily within the context of the local church. And I want to remind you here that the Great Commission was given to the church. It is through the church that disciples are to be brought and made. Now, I'm, I'm thankful for Bible colleges. I went to Bible college. James went to Bible college. Most pastors have gone to Bible college. I'm thankful for mission societies. I'm thankful for uni groups and uni ministries and other parachurch organizations, and they play an important part. But the church biblically speaking, is responsible for discipleship. And I think too often we see church merely as a place to whet your appetite. But we'll give you a taste of, of what it means to be a Christian. We'll give you some basic doctrines. And if you want to learn more, you've got to sign up for a college course. But I think that we're skirting our responsibility as a church if we fail to help them grow beyond the elementary. And surely there will be, there will be a ceiling eventually. And then that's when postgraduate studies and perhaps like as James is doing a, a, a PhD, you know, it's important to have that academic help. But they are to supplement the discipleship of a Christian the meat and potatoes should come from within the church because it is the pastor's job to equip God's people for works of service. We should be able to teach you, and admittedly, this falls on the pastors. It is a tough job. If you think about just the, the interpersonal things and then you add on top the academic and the theological aspects of being a Christian, it's tough. Where do you find time to read the books? <laughs> Where do you find time to, to, to study and, and expand and stretch your knowledge? It is a tough job. It is a demanding job. And there are only so many hours in a day. But it's my job. <laughs> and it's our job as pastors. And one way that we, we want to try and, and do this is by introducing classes um, so we'll, we'll announce this later on, but we will be running a class on baptism and, and church membership, what that means, to try and equip you in, in these different issues that we won't necessarily be able to address from the weekly preaching. And we're doing this because we want to be a church that is committed to equipping and making and growing mature disciples. And lastly, this is one application that is relevant to the entire Great Commission, and that is to love and prioritize your local church. Love and prioritize your local church. Now, as I've mentioned before, we have in our own church our own growth groups. We have our own kids club, and we have our own youth group, and these are all expressions of our obedience to the Great Commission. You may be asking, why bother even run a youth group when you've only got four people and sometimes you even have to cancel it because when one person goes, everyone goes. Like That is the reality of it. Should our response then be to just shut it down because it's hard? 
That's why I salute those who, who do run it and those who do volunteer to keep it going because it doesn't matter whether we have a large youth group or a small youth group, the motivation shouldn't be size, it should be faithfulness. And so we should be, as a church, coming alongside, supporting and encouraging and providing reinforcements to these ministries. So if you're not part of a growth group, I'd like to encourage you to be part of one. And you'll find yourself encouraged, strengthened, and fed. Contribute. If you know more about one particular thing, come to youth group and share. And in doing so, you're sharpening other people as well. Another way to do this is to consider sending your kids to our youth group and to our Laundry Kids Club. You know, it's, it's important that we, we love our local church and we prioritize our local church. So as you can see, the Great Commission, that is to make disciples, is a daunting task. It has eternal repercussions. To think about that those conversations that you have about the gospel, about God, could potentially, God could use that to convert them. And then you'll see them in heaven. And it's even more daunting that when God, when Jesus himself gave the Great Commission, he's thinking about individual people carrying this task out. So you are valuable, and you have an important part to play, but it is a daunting task, which is why I'm grateful that Jesus also says in Acts 1.8 that God has given us the Holy Spirit. He has not left us alone and powerless and without aid. And in our text, he says at the end of verse 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, till Christ returns. Christ knows who is his. Christ is the one who will build his church, and we just have the great privilege to be his hands and feet. The end is secure. We just need to be faithful in our task to make disciples. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we know that it is especially difficult at times to convince people about their need of a savior. And that stems from the thinking that it is our job to make Christians, but it's not up to us, Lord. You don't demand us to cause conversions and to cause people to believe in you. That's, that's your job. But you do call us to faithfulness. And one area that we need to be faithful in is this area of the Great Commission, that is to make disciples. Lord, I pray that we would be a church that is marked by people who are actively going out in their community, in their immediate contexts, and even outside of their contexts. If there's anyone here who desires to go out into the foreign mission field, help us to support them in that endeavor. Help us, Lord, to be a church that is known for evangelism, calling people to faith in Christ, and then baptizing them, causing them to publicly declare that they are one of you. But hope also help us, Lord, to be a church marked by teaching, <coughs> building up the church, discipling them, helping them to grow to Christ-likeness, not just knowledge, but life change. There are so much opportunities to do that. We read in our Bible reading about how that, how that could occur, even within the, the relationships between those who are older and those who are younger. The younger men learning from the older men, the younger women learning from the older women, about what it means to live that Christian life. Lord, there are so much opportunities to disciple each other, to spur each other to Christ-likeness. Help us, Lord, to see those needs 
and convict us, Lord, to help fill that need by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.